Welcome to the Daily Dispatch. First, we'll take you to Afghanistan, where the Afghan Taliban have banned women from going to universities. Next, we'll talk about the first ever European Union ASEAN conference and a quick wrap up of their relationships. And lastly, Ukraine's president has embarked on his first foreign trip to the United States since the start of Russia Ukraine war. We'll tell you about the defense deals that are likely to follow this visit. We're here to give you the news and to help you infer the world around you. I'm Tayyabana Nassar Khan, and here is your Daily Dispatch. The Taliban government has barred access to the universities for females. This decision was taken in a cabinet meeting on December 20, 2022. This comes as the latest in the series of news, including public floggings and a ban on media outlets that has led to questions over the protection of human rights in the country. These measures have also raised concerns that the Afghan Taliban have reneged on its promises to ensure women's rights and media freedom, going back to their previous governance model when they took power in 1996, ending a brutal civil war in Afghanistan back then, but implementing a draconian system, including the banning of music, denying public spaces for women, and also carrying out public executions. Now, these developments are also being seen as a reflection of a split between the spiritual leadership based in Kandahar and some of the moderate members of the cabinet. It is becoming increasingly clear that hardliners are playing a more dominant role. The ban on university education for women will likely elicit a negative reaction from the entire international community and undermine Taliban's efforts to get international recognition and economic assistance as fears rise that the humanitarian situation will deteriorate in Afghanistan without the financial support and development funds. The United Nations Relief Chief, Martin Griffiths, recently said that Afghanistan needs $4.6 billion to meet its humanitarian needs. More than 90% of the population lives in poverty. 20 million people face acute hunger, while two-thirds of the population requires urgent humanitarian assistance to survive. Now, the lack of international recognition a looming humanitarian situation, along with increasing attacks by terrorist organizations like the ISKP, present fears of an economic collapse in Afghanistan. Next, we'll take you to Brussels, where the European Union, the EU, and the Association of Southeast Asian Nations, the ASEAN, have held their first ever summit in Brussels to commemorate the 45th anniversary of diplomatic ties established back in 1977. The EU and ASEAN are considered to be two of the most advanced and successful regional organizations. ASEAN is the EU's third largest trading partner outside of Europe, with $223 billion in trade, while the European Union accounts for 10.6% of ASEAN's trade. EU is also the largest source of foreign direct investment in ASEAN. Given the importance of the EU-ASEAN economic ties, they upgraded their partnership to the strategic level in 2020. A number of issues came under discussion between the leaders of the EU and ASEAN at the summit, including peace and security, connectivity and digital, clean energy, the COVID-19 pandemic, and regional and international issues. The summit happens as strategic rivalry increases between China and the US in the Indo-Pacific region, and global supply chains have been affected by the COVID-19 as well, and also the Russia-Ukraine war has raised concerns regarding the stability of international order. Now, 40% of EU's trade passes through the South China Sea, making peace and maritime security a priority for both EU and the ASEAN countries. Besides economic significance, being part of the North Atlantic Treaty Organization, the Indo-Pacific region holds considerable significance for the European countries, with the EU unveiling its Indo-Pacific strategy in 2021. Also on the dispatch, We'll give you updates on what's going on on the sidelines of the main battleground theater of the Russia-Ukraine war. Ukraine's president, Volodymyr Zelensky, is traveling to the United States on what is his first foreign visit since the Russia-Ukraine war began in February this year. On the agenda is a meeting with President Joe Biden to discuss the strengthening of Ukraine's security and defense capabilities, as well as an address to the U.S. Congress. This news comes at a time when the U.S. is expected to announce the approval of a $1.8 billion aid package, which also includes the supplying of the Patriot missile to Ukraine. Now, moreover, experts suggest that the U.S. Congress is also ready to vote on another defense aid package worth $45 billion for the war-struck country, 
The U.S. had so far remained on the fence about providing Ukraine air defense systems. However, it is now likely to send the systems as a response to the civilian infrastructural damage which has been caused by the Russian missile attacks in Ukraine. It is important to remember that Patriot missiles are an advanced medium-range air and missile defense system that would expand Ukraine's available air cover, especially at a time when the current stock of air defense missiles is low. And there are risks that the current stock of the missiles could run out if used beyond the high priority targets, as was evidenced in Ukraine's deployment of the Guided Multiple Launch Rocket System, or the GMLRS munition, a precise strike rocket that played a pivotal role in regaining the control of Kherson. Meanwhile, Russia has warned the US that these Patriot missiles would become a legitimate target if the equipment is supplied to Ukraine. The Foreign Ministry spokesperson, Maria Zakharova, also stated that Russia considers this move provocative and could prompt a response from Russia without further elaborating on the nature of this response. And now, an update on a story we covered earlier, where the TTP terrorists had taken over a counter-terrorism department detainment facility in Bannu on Sunday, holding security officers hostage and demanding safe passage to Afghanistan. Pakistan Special Forces successfully raided the counter-terrorism center in the northwestern province, Khyber Pakhtunkhwa, killing all of the 33 TTP fighters. Muhammad Ali Saif, a government spokesperson in Khyber Pakhtunkhwa, said that the Taliban hostage takers were given a chance to surrender before the raid, but refused. Unfortunately, securing the facilities came at a cost. Defense Minister Khwaja Muhammad Asif told the parliament that two hostages were killed by the fighters, and the rest had been freed. It was also reported that 15 security personnel were wounded in Tuesday's operation and two SSG commandos were martyred. Despite this incident or the recent spate of violence, the experts suggest it remains clear that the current period of uncertainty is incomparable to the massive wave of terrorism Pakistan faced while the war on terror in Afghanistan was going on, especially from 2007 to 2016. The TTP is now unable to capture any sizable territory in Pakistan as it did at that time. Sporadic terrorist activities, most likely in parts of the country bordering Afghanistan, may not be easy to prevent, but an organized wave of violence evolving into mass-scale terrorism remains highly unlikely. Time for some chilly news now. Record-breaking winds are entering the United States and are set to affect approximately 50 million people in 48 out of 50 states of the US with stronger currents in these central states. Now, the storm is commonly being dubbed the bomb cyclone and will likely envelop large swaths of the country in extreme cold, causing blizzard-like conditions. Now, during the winters, the temperature usually averages 0.7 degrees Celsius across the US, with the states of Minnesota and Alaska experiencing minus 10.9 and minus 16.3 degrees Celsius on average as the coldest states. However, with the current storm, Regions in the U.S. are likely to experience temperatures that dip as low as minus 22 degrees Celsius or minus 40 degrees Fahrenheit in the same areas. They could also dip as low as minus 38 degrees Celsius or minus 70 degrees Fahrenheit, disrupting the travel plans during this holiday season. This is the first time extremely cold temperatures like these are going to be experienced in three decades, and such extreme temperatures could be life-threatening especially if the storm leads to power cuts and such temperatures capable of causing frostbites within a minute. Now, with many states already experiencing heavy rainfall and snowfall, with more than 200,000 homes and businesses having been impacted by the power outages, it looks like the snow isn't going to stop anytime soon. We wish a safe season ahead for everyone and anyone who will experience the bomb cyclone. Stay safe and stay warm. Some more news from the Twitter drama now. Elon Musk has announced that he is ready to step down as the head of Twitter. His tweet read, I will resign as CEO as soon as I find someone foolish enough to take the job. After that, I will just run the software and service teams. This announcement comes after Elon Musk held a Twitter poll where he asked the Twitterates and netizens whether he should step down as the CEO of the platform. 57.5%, almost 10 million people, voted in favor. Well, 42.5% opposed this poll. Twitter has been in the eye of the storm for multiple reasons. Since it was acquired by Elon Musk for a $44 billion US deal. After the takeover, Elon Musk fired the company's then CEO, Parag Agarwal, and the CFO, Ned Sagal, in a live podcast with Joe Rogan. And ever since its takeover, 
Elon Musk has taken multiple decisions that have been dubbed questionable by his critics. And since then, the platform has been embroiled in drama. From a controversial move charging $8 for the blue tick verification, and mass layoffs of the employees and content moderation teams, to allowing the return of previously banned individuals such as the former US President Donald Trump and banning of the senior journalists from reputed news platforms. Twitter has faced a lot of scrutiny. And for now, all eyes are currently on the question of who Elon Musk will choose to replace himself. With everyone interested in the social media company curious if the new CEO will be able to steer Twitter away from negative news and stabilize its financial outlook. That's all folks. We'd be happy to receive your feedback and suggestions. We'd be back tomorrow with more bite-sized news that keeps you up to date with what's going on in the country, the region, and the globe. I'm Tayyab Anasar Khan, and this was your Daily Dispatch.